morning, everyone. Um, happy to be here today to present uh, Psychzone. And so Psychzone is a public company listed on NASDAQ First North under the ticker Psycho. Uh, I just want to remind you about this forward-looking statement disclaimer. Uh, Psychzone was listed back in 2016, and um, we are developing a couple of drugs in the autoimmune space with the aspirations of transforming uh, these indications. So we have a molecule, small molecule called Rebeximod, which is indicated for rheumatoid arthritis. And then we have another molecule based on a peptide called T20K, which we developed in multiple sclerosis. Um, we have developed these molecules uh, to different stages. Uh, Rebeximod is in phase two development. It has completed the phase 2A study, and I will come back to that. And the T20K project has been through a first in human study, and we are now back into preclinical activities to uh, explore T20K in a combination with a capopoid receptor agonist. Uh, for the continuation of this, um, Presentation, I will uh, focus on Rebeximod, which is our lead asset. Uh, and it's our story now is uh, around a new value proposition. We have, during the summer, reassessed the market and what has recently happened on the market and come up with a new strategy for Rebeximod. Uh, so a number of points that are very important for the development of drugs in this space uh, is to look at what's happening here. So uh, lately we have had uh, the development for the JAK inhibitors that have uh, received regulatory restrictions. Uh, we have also the development when it comes to the TNF alpha inhibitors that have reached uh, or uh, are meeting strong competition from uh, quite a number of biosimilars, especially on the US market. And what we see is that there is a lack of treatment options for individuals that are treated with TNF-alpha inhibitors. And that's a space where we see an opportunity to place Rebeximod. Uh, what we have demonstrated so far is that we have clinical effect in 225 patients with severe rheumatoid arthritis. So we're quite confident into moving into this patient segment uh, that do not respond to TNF uh, inhibitors. We have a very favorable safety profile collected from almost 300 patients. And we see that we can add value to the current standard of care. So when it comes to this patient segment uh, that do not uh, adequately respond to TNF blockers, uh, there's quite a number of them actually. Uh, so up to 30, 30 to 50 percent that do not uh, adequately meet their uh, treatment objectives with the TNF blockers and therefore need to be switched to something else. Uh, and what we see with Rebeximod is that we can provide an adjunct therapy to the TNF blockers. So just uh, um, a couple of slides here on rheumatoid arthritis. It's a chronic disease, of course, causing joint pain and uh, deformities of the joints. Uh, it's, it requires lifelong treatment. But as I mentioned, many patients do not benefit from um, the first line treatment and needs to be switched to a second line treatment. And there we see also a not quite a number of patients that do not benefit. There is a need for new oral medications that provides more, much more freedom to uh, individuals. The current TNF blockers are injectables. People need to come back to the hospital to get these injections. And so it's important to make sure that we can maintain um, treatment over the course of the disease as it develops. One aspect here uh, is to come in quite early and mitigate the effects of macrophages. So macrophages is a cell type that established themselves quite early in the disease course. They will continue together with T cells to drive the disease over time. 
Uh, we're working with Martin Kron as our medical advisor. He is a rheumatologist, and back in two, 2001, when they started to work with macrophages and exploring the effect of macrophages in rheumato uh, rheumatoid arthritis, they discovered that we need to reduce the number of macrophages in the joint in order to treat these patients. And just to give you a, an image here of what is happening in the joint of a rheumatoid arthritis patient, it's a very complex system where you have a number of the players in the immune system playing a part. But one of the central parts, as I mentioned, and from a very early um, stage in the disease is the macrophage. Even though it's been known for quite a number of years that macrophages are very important in driving disease, there are no treatments out there that actually target macrophages. And that's where we see Rebexmod come in. Uh, it is very selectively impacting of the macrophage function, but it's also impacting on the macrophage establishment. So that's a very unique property to Rebexmod. Uh, we have demonstrated this in clinical trials. So this is a 225 patient study in severe rheumatoid arthritis. And with our 50 milligram dose, we see that we're providing bene a clinical benefit to this patient from week eight to week 12. And then we stop the treatment at week 12 and we see a sustained improvement of patients over the next four ye uh, weeks, which is quite unique. And it's really built on this that we continue this development in a different patient population and we're quite confident moving into a new patient population uh, where there's uh, little treatment opportunities today. So moving on to the business case, of course, Rebexmod is moving into a quite established market. We have Humira as the best-selling drug, selling for 20 billion US dollars per year. Uh, Humira is indicated for indicated in 16 uh, different indications, but one of the main indications, of course, is rheumatoid arthritis. So it's a well-established market with a number of molecules, but we see the launch of biosimilars to Humira that happened this year in the US, which will greatly impact on this market. You will, if we look into the treatment course here, we will see that patient that go on the first line treatment will quickly switch into a combination of metotrexate and TNF alpha blockers, Humira. But after a while, these patients stop meeting their treatment objectives with Humira and other TNF blockers. And therefore, they need something else. That's where we now position Rebexmod, and we see that as a great op opportunity. We see that this would function as, a, as an adjunct therapy to the combination of metrexate and TNF blockers. And it's also very much backed by Cupinion leaders that we're talking to both in the US and in Europe. So what we aim to do now is to investigate this in small studies, so 20, 30 uh, patients, proof of concept studies. Uh, and we're currently uh, setting up uh, these uh, activities with Cupinion leaders in Europe. Um, one of the triggers for this strategic change was that we also have a new patent for Rebexamod. The original patent uh, is lapsing in 2028, and we have, of course, completed that with a number of other supplementary patents to that, but we have a new composition matter patent that, will, that was granted in the US, and that will give us a patent life, lifetime to 2042. So, in summary, we, Rebexamod is a molecule with novel mode of action uh, that uh, is targeting central disease drivers. We have documented phase two efficacy and safety, and we have a convenient non-injectable oral administration, very important. Uh, established market, favorable partnership opportunities, and a very strong patent portfolio. Uh, just briefly here, we are targeting macrophages. This is a busy slide. But in the middle here is the macrophage indicating that we also have an opportunity to move into a number of other indications within the autoimmunity, autoinflammatory continuum. 
150 different indications within this space. So they're very um, excited about also uh, in exploring other indications. So, and just briefly here at the end, we do have a, um, announced a rights issue uh, coming up. We have secured 20 million SEC in that rights issue, but of course would be happy to see new shareholders coming in. So, and here are the arguments that I've already, already touched on why we see this as a very interesting opportunity. So I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Carl Magnus. Um, so questions are rolling in here. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the feedback you've gotten from clinicians uh, on the results that you've seen so far with Remexma? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, we have a very exciting process right now where we're reaching out to opinion leaders uh, in Europe. We have, during the summer, also talked to a number of them in the US. Uh, and we do see a lot of enthusiasm around this molecule because they see the opportunity to actually add it on to the mix of metrexate TNF-alpha blockers, and then they can um, put metri uh, or Rebeximod on top of that. Mm. So that's a very unique opportunity to Rebeximod. Uh, we also see that there is a strong interest in the mechanism of Rebeximod targeting macrophages because it's been um, recognized for you know over 20 years now that macrophages are driving this, and they try to to deal with that with TNF alpha blockers. So TNF alpha is a molecule that is released by macrophages, mm -hmm. but macrophages are doing so much more. So if you can impact on the macrophage more directly. Uh, they see that this could be a very interesting approach of treating uh, RA. Mm -hmm. um, someone here s is saying uh, clin the clinical effects seem to be correlated with the, with the dose, higher is better. Uh, so d do side effects exist or does that inhibit a higher uh, dose for patients? Yeah, so, so when it comes to um, Rebeximod, we've actually seen that the higher dose is not necessarily better. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, decided to move forward with the 15 milligram, and this is based on the phase 2a study. Uh, and, and we see that mostly uh, due to the fact that we do s have better effect with that dose. When it comes to tolerability, we have tested Rebeximod up to 100 milligrams, so we have quite a span up up to where we see uh, tolerability issues. Mm. Uh, so we're quite confident moving forward with 50 milligram in this. Of course, we would also like to explore uh, a slightly higher dose, but we will see what, what that opportunity arises in these, uh, or in these uh, trials. Mm. And do you have a biomarker strategy in addition to TNF alpha blockers, not, uh, to TNF alpha blocker non-responders uh, to select a patient most likely to benefit from your drug? Yes, it's very relevant to uh, build in biomarkers, of course. Um, uh, and this is also a very central question for the upcoming proof of concept activities that we are running. So um, as we are uh, interacting with these KOLs, they also have a very strong interest in, in, in exploring those translational, translational uh, activities. So we see that together with them, we can actually um, find relevant biomarkers that uh, could be utilized uh, together with Rebeximod. Mm -hmm. um, will, um, will you be able to use these important data from these studies in upcoming studies? Indeed, we are um, utilizing these, the, da the data that we have collected uh, to a great extent as we now are designing our uh, new studies. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the um, uh, primary endpoints, uh, what are the primary endpoints for the phase two study with Rebeximod? So, so the primary endpoints that you typically explore when you go into phase two studies, more um, sort of regulated phase two studies uh, are uh, based on the DAS28 score, mm -hmm. uh, where you ass assess uh, 28 different joints in, in the body. But uh, in these exploratory studies that we are now aiming to do, we will be looking at so many 
other different signals. So biomarkers, for instance, is, mm -hmm. is one of the important ones. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for answering the questions and for your presentation, Carl Mike. Thank you. Thanks a lot.